Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our study here. If you join me with a word of prayer, in a word of prayer. <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath hours that are coming, and we invite your presence. We have a great need of you in our lives. Living in this world of sin and suffering, we know, Lord, that there are so many things to distract us and to draw us away from you. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to empower us. We ask, Lord, that we can cooperate with you in the work that you're doing in our lives. We pray for those that are studying these truths. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you can help them. We need an understanding of these, of these truths that we're going to read about because of the time that we are in. But even then, we need them just because um, we are sinners in need of your help. And so we call upon you uh, to be with us now as we study that you can help us to see the things that we need to see and that we can be an influence for good in this world around us. Thank you for each person. May you bless them. May your angels watch over them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. There's just a few of us here so far, and um, I probably could have waited a little bit longer, but I know it's harder when the sun sets later on Fridays, people have things to do. So not everybody is always, um, doesn't always get everything done. So, but I think this time that we spend together on Friday evenings is pretty important, especially the topic that we've been studying, of course, is the third angel's message. Now this is A.T. Jones, 1895 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. And uh, we've looked at the first two. The first one represented the image of the beast. The first study in this second one was, um, the topic was uh, the papacy. So we'll begin reading and discuss the things as needed. Uh, we've looked at the evidences which reveal to us the existence and active working of both the beast and his image in the United States, both are even now grasping for supreme power, governmental power, to be used in enforcing the same thing, the mark of the beast. Our, our message is against that. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. It is not enough, however, for us to tell the people that the course that these others are following is wrong, unless we show to them that this is so. It is not for us to say it unless we can cause them by the scriptures to see it. And therefore, the lesson we will study now is the reasons why this thing is wrong. We will begin with Philippians 3.20, reading the revised version. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Lord's statement concerning every Christian. Every Christian's citizenship is in heaven. The authorized version is, our conversation is in heaven. But that word conversation does not mean simply our words and the conversation which we have one with another in talking about neighborly affairs or whatever it may be, but our manner of life, our course of conduct, our walk, is in heaven. Now, as our citizenship, the citizenship of every Christian, is in heaven, what has any citizen of heaven or of the heavenly government rightly to do with the political or governmental affairs of any other government or any other kingdom? In fact, what has a citizen of any government rightly to do with the political concerns or management of any other government? These people of whom we have been reading in the previous lessons 
profess to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, profess to be though, those whose citizenship, the scripture says, is in heaven, but they are constantly involving themselves in the political workings of the governments of this earth. They profess to have a citizenship in heaven, and yet they manipulate the affairs of the kingdom of, of earth. They profess to be citizens of the kingdom of God, yet they propose to regulate the affairs of the governments of men. But that is the thing that never can be rightly done. If a citizen of Great Britain should come into the United States, still retaining his citizenship in the government of Great Britain, and should take part or attempt to take part in the political affairs of this government, his action in that respect would be resented by every citizen of the United States. It matters not with what party he might wish to ally, ally himself and work. They would not have it. They would say, that is none of your business. You do not belong here. You are a citizen of another government. If the laws of this country do not suit you, that is not, nothing to that has nothing to do with the case. The political systems of this country suit us. And if things do not suit you, just let them alone or else change your citizenship from the government to which you belong and bring your citizenship here. And then begin to discuss the laws and how they should be made and what they should be. You know that that is so. You know that that is the way that a citizen of another country would be treated by all the citizens of this country, if he should undertake to manipulate, to control, or have any part in the political concerns of this country, that is not denying his right to live here. He may do that. But all do deny his right and his various citizenship in another, in another country denies his right to have anything to do with the citizenship of this country or with the political affairs of this country. As the Christian citizenship is in heaven, that itself, the very principle of it, prohibits him from taking part in any of the polit political concerns of any other government, even though it be the government of the United States. And that is so. It exists in the very nature of the case. It lies at the very principle of citizenship itself. Not to dwell too long on any one text, although each text that shall be read will tell the whole story. Turn next to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is not simply the ordained minister. For all who receive the grace of God are to minister that. They are ministers of his grace. So it is written, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Even if it were confined to the ministry, this text would not be out of place in this connection because it is the ministry that takes the lead in all this work of the beast and his image and is managing the whole movement, leading the people under their charge into these devious and evil ways. So then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is one sent and accredited by one government as the representative of that government to another country. Now, the principle of ambassadorship prohibits him from any interference whatever with the political concerns of the government to which he is accredited. If the British ambassador to, to the United States, that is tonight in Washington City, or the ambassador from France or any other of these countries should express an opinion upon or take part in any of the political concerns of this country, his sovereign would be immediately notified that he was no longer an accepted person here and would be called upon to withdraw him from the position of ambassador in this country. That has been done at least twice in my recollection. In one of Grant's administrations, the Russian minister to this country touched in some slight way upon some political issue, a mere insignificant one so far as any particular turn of politics was concerned. Yet he was sent out of the country at once, recalled. In the campaign between Cleveland and Harrison, the first time, you remember the British minister to this country, Sackville West, received a letter from Mr. 
merchant of California who pretended, whether it was correct or not, to be a British subject. And in the letter were some questions and observations upon the then current issues of the presidential campaign. The British minister answered the letter and expressed an opinion. The letter was published and a dispatch was immediately sent to the court of St. James, demanding his recall when he was recalled. These are cited merely to illustrate the recognized principles of ambassadorship among nations, among men. We are ambassadors for Christ. These church leaders who are building up the beast and his image profess to stand in the place and profess to be ambassadors for Christ. Yet they don't not only express opinions, but they lay down laws, they manipulate campaigns, they mold politics and shape the whole political course of the governments among the nations and the people to whom they are accredited and thus violate the first, last, and every principle that is involved in ambassadorship. Here then are two distinct reasons given in these two plain scriptures. The same principle expressed in two ways that demonstrate that the course of these professed citizens of the heavenly kingdom, these professed ambassadors for Christ, is absolutely wrong. And our preaching the message and the warning against the worship of the beast and his image, against the evils which are simply the result of the violation of the principles here laid down, our opposition to that, our war warning against it, must be one of principle and not merely in theory, nor from policy, unless our proclamation against it is founded upon principle and is loyal to principle, our proclamation will amount to nothing. If we hold in theory only that it is wrong and make the proclamation against it even in the words of scripture and in practice ourselves violate the principle, our proclamation will amount to nothing. So that our connection with this must be with the principle and that in principle and in loyalty to the principle and that from the heart, not in theory, not assenting to it merely. The principles of Jesus Christ speak to the heart. They take hold of the heart and are of value only as they have hold upon the heart. If they do not have hold upon the heart, the man who professes these principles will violate them in his actions, even though he be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, um, he's, well, Jones is usually fairly direct, but uh, here I don't think he's, he's direct enough. I mean, he should just, because I think it's because Adventists would understand the point that, that we aren't to be political. And the reason that we're not political so far, he says we are citizens of heaven and we are ambassadors of Christ, but we definitely don't act like it. Now, when I was growing up, my dad believed in what they called um, the social gospel, right? So he, minister of the United Church of Canada, very liberal. Um, they were, he was interested in, in making the world a better place. And even though I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist and, and hardly a Christian as a child, I mean, you know, I believed I was, but I wasn't. Um, um, I understood that you weren't going to solve the world's problems through politics, that that seemed to be a fruitless, fruitless endeavor, and that the real problems that existed had to do with the fact that, um, that people as individuals were corrupt, and that the only way that you could change the world would be to change individuals from the inside not from the outside. So I'm not quite sure where I got these ideas from, but uh, that's what I believed, you know, growing up as a child, that, um, that people had to change, that you wouldn't be able to just control people through laws, through the government. Uh, you couldn't make the world a better place that way. So I wasn't, you know, I was a pacifist. I wasn't uh, really very political. Um, and only for a short time as a teenager, I was kind of interested in politics, just that's what you hear all the time. Um, but 
I realized again, you know, you weren't going to change uh, the world through politics. But um, and politics goes much more to much more than just to the politics of the world. It even has to do with the principles of the gospel, right? So if you if you manipulate someone, and let's say not even let's even take it a step back from there, just in our interactions with others, um, you know, a man convinced is against his will is of the same opinion still. Um, you know, so often we want to win a battle in, a, in an argument. Um, but to what purpose? You know, we want to exercise authority over people. But to what purpose? How will we ultimately benefit from such a thing? So, so this principle of God's kingdom as Seventh-day Adventists, we would see that it, it applies in every whit whether we're talking on, on the big you know, stage of world politics or even just our interactions with others. You know, the idea of manipulating people, or controlling them in some way, instead of allowing them to act freely without coercion. Um, and you wouldn't want to have a relationship with someone that was based upon coercion or manipulation. I mean, if they said they loved you, merely because they felt they had to, um, I don't think it would be uh, true love, and I don't think it would be uh, something that could last. So, so to me, all of these principles apply in the sense that um, in every interaction that we have with others, we need to have the character of Christ, which never controls, um, which is a manifestation of love. That's what people need. So, uh, when the Protestant churches lost the power of the gospel, they sought the power of the state. And any time we seek power to control, uh, it's a lack of faith and trust in God. <clears throat> anyway, Jones is going to go on. Our citizenship is in heaven. And of all, all people, our citizenship is in heaven from when we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. If his kingdom were of this world, then for what kingdom would his servants fight? For the kingdom of this world? For what kingdom would they contend? For what would they work? For the kingdom of this world? Or for the kingdom of this world. Then the man who fights for the kingdom of this world, who contends for supremacy and power in the kingdom of this world, denies his connection with the kingdom of Jesus Christ. For his kingdom is not of this world. But that is what these men are doing who are leading in this movement of which we have read in two preceding lessons. They seek to take possession of the kingdoms of this world, to rule the governments of this world, to fight, actually to fight, for the governments of this world to work to put themselves in place of position and relationship to the governments of this world. And therefore, they proclaim with the loudest voice that they possibly can, that they are not, that they are of this world and not of the kingdom of Christ at all. Another scripture in connection with the same thing is found in Luke 22, 24 to 26. There was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest in the kingdom, which they expected to come upon this earth, the kingdom, which um, they expected Christ to set up, and which they expected would be a kingdom of this world, and in which they would have a place. There was a strife among them as, as to which should be accounted the greatest, and which would have the greatest place in that expected kingdom. It was a mistaken idea, to be sure, with respect to the kingdom. But the lesson that he gave them upon it is applicable in all cases of the kind. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise, exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Factors, agents, benefactors, agents of good. 
That is what these church leaders now profess to be, agents of good to the country, to the people, to be working the redemption of cities, states, and nations. Thus, they would now be called benefactors, but he shall not be so. So what? These exercise lordship over them and exercise authority upon them. Ye shall not be so. Where? Why ye shall not exercise authority and lordship over one another in the church, in the place where you do belong. How then about exercising authority and lordship over people in a place where you do not belong at all? Another verse in connection with one, with the one we had a moment ago. My kingdom is not of this world. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Colossians 1, verse 12 and 13. What we want to study there is the contrast between this light and the darkness. Delivered us from the power of darkness. That is not simply the power that darkness itself exerts upon us. But the idea is delivered us from the dominion, the rulership, the government of darkness. Brought us out from under the jurisdiction of the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There are defined, there are defined the dominion, the rulership, and the authority that rules the darkness of this world. <coughs> now we will contend against that. And only those who can contend successfully who have been delivered from the power of that darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. In this, I'm not saying that the kings and the other rules of the political governments of this world are the rulers of the darkness referred to in the text. The text is not quoted for that. The rulers of the darkness here referred to, we all know to be the spiritual powers of darkness. But the text says that these spiritual powers are the rulers of the darkness of this world. And it therefore shows that this world is in that darkness and is of that darkness and shows therefore that kingdoms and governments being of this world only are in and of the darkness. That is what the text is quoted for. Now read in Ephesians 5.8, you were sometimes darkness. When? Why? When we were subject to the rulers of the darkness of this world, when we were in sin. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the world. Walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. <laughs> now, one of the things we can see here, that, that we can hopefully see the direction that Jones is going and how, how far he's going to go in this study, I can't remember. But, I mean, he laid down this principle in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, and that is that in order to pass the Sunday Law Test, I'm just kind of putting it in my own words, um, we have to be converted, that it's not enough to just know about the Sunday Sabbath issue, that it is a matter of character, of Christ-like character. And we can see then that if we are on the side of darkness, that is, if we have not experienced Christ's righteousness, no amount of knowledge about the things that are going to happen in this world will save us. And if we're, if we're exercising um, the principles of the kingdom of darkness, controlling, manipulating, um, seeking to have power over others, even if we sort of stand as um, people who are defending religious liberty, the only reason we defend it is because our liberty is being um, opposed. But if we are in the position that we can 
we can be the ones in charge, so to speak, and we will exercise that power of darkness. And so we're demonstrating what kingdom we are of based upon the character that we have. The Sunday Law test is not testing our knowledge about end time events. It's testing our character. Do we trust God? Are we of his kingdom? Is that the thing that matters to us? Are we citizens of heaven or are we citizens of earth? Um, so the world's under the dominion of darkness. Darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Are governments and municipalities of the kingdom of God or of this world? They belong to this world and to this world alone. That is the side of darkness. But he who is translated out of darkness, delivered from that darkness, and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, is of another world. He belongs to another world. He is connected with another world. And that world, indeed, is the heavenly world. The city to which he belongs is the heavenly city. There is his citizenship in the dominion of the world of light. Then what connection has that kingdom of light with the kingdoms of darkness? What has that government which is in the light and of the light to do with the governments that are in the darkness and of the darkness? What have those who professed, as these national reformers do, to belong to the dominion of light, to do with the kingdom of that light, what have these rightly to do with the affairs of darkness and the rulership of the dominions that pertain only to the world of darkness? What fellowship hath light with darkness? That question belongs here. And the same thought is expressed right here in connection with the text we are studying. Read now the whole connection. <clears throat> ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk. As children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is, is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. How much of the world is to be embraced under the dominion of the beast and his image? All the world. What is our message? If any man worship the beast and his image, that is our message to the world. How much of the world is that message due and applicable? All the world. Then what has that message to do but to do this very thing? To have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Will that message be a reproving message to everyone that is engaged in the work of the beast and his image? It will. Thus, the work of the beast and his image is violative, violative, vil, vil, I don't know how to pronounce that word. <clears throat> it's, uh, I don't even know what the word means, but it's of the principle of the citizenship of the kingdom of God. Um, or any other kingdom, violative of the principle of the ambassador of Jesus Christ, or any other ambassadorship, <clears throat> um, viol violative of the principle that Jesus Christ laid down for his disciples as to seeking uh, place and, and authority, violative of the principle of his that separates the government of God from the governments of this earth, that separates between light and darkness. It is simply an attempt to blend light and darkness and is always and only darkness that will seek to blend the government of light with the government of darkness. So I think that word would mean sort of it's a type of causation. Let's look it up here. No, it means to offend. That's what it means. So it's an offense. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, so thus the work of the beast in the image is an offense to the principles of the citizenship of the kingdom of God. That makes more sense. Or of any other kingdom. So it's an offense of the principle 
of the ambassador of Jesus Christ. Right. So, so basically, the work of the beast and his image is a violation. That's what it, I should have thought of that. Uh, violation of these principles. That makes sense. There. <clears throat> So if we try to blend light and darkness, if we try to be involved in the politics of the world and make this world a better place, we're blending light and darkness. We're blending the government of light with the governments of darkness. And that makes sense, what, what Jones is saying there. Uh, there are several other texts that I would want to read, John 17, 14 and onward. Christ's prayer for his disciples. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. In another place, he says to them, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, um, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Now the 18th verse, if the world hate you, ye you know that it hated me before it hated you. Then turn to another place and you will find the statement of Christ. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. When the beast and his image govern the world, and here are people that are testifying against it, testifying that its works are evil, then what will follow? That people will be hated. But if one does not testify to the world that its works are evil, is the world going to hate him? Oh no, the world will love its own. Now read on in the 17th chapter of John in the 14th verse. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So one of the things that Adventism has done, I mean, that led to uh, the state that Adventism is in, did Adventists like being hated by the world? Yeah, they did not like being hated by the world. So Heidi says negative. <clears throat> and so what did they do about it? What did the church do when they were called a cult? They got together with the evangelicals and said, you know, we're not a cult. There's no reason you should hate us. Right? You know, or single us out as separate and different than the other Christians. Yeah, but but don't don't we realize that that should be that way if we are of Christ, because the world hated Christ. So why would we seek to be accepted by the world? Because we want to be of the world. Now, of course, the excuse always is, well, we want to be able to witness to them. So we're going to study in their, their universities and colleges. We're going to accept their doctrines. We're going to still have our distinct Adventist doctrines. But of course, as time goes on, they become less and less distinct. So that they're hardly recognizable from the doctrines of the world. So one of the reasons that the church will support the Sunday law is because the church is like the world. But it's also true of us because we often think, well, because we recognize the condition of the church, that we're not like the church. But we are of the world because we act in a way that shows that our kingdom is of this world. There is a standard. There is a measure of compassion that tests our relationship to this world. That is Jesus Christ. 
they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Here are these national reformed church leaders professing to be not of this world. And if that profession be true, they will act as Jesus Christ did when he was in this world with respect to governmental affairs on the earth. That is what we are talking about now. The beast and his image are of the world. If these church leaders are right, if they are of the truth, if they are of Christ's truth, then they are no more of the world and no more interfering and taking part with the affairs of this world or seeking to control in political affairs than Jesus Christ did himself in the world. And to what extent did he do that? He never touched it. Were there not evils in his day that ought to have been corrected? Evils in city government? Why in the world did he not set about to redeem Jerusalem and Rome by political wireworking? Why didn't he? Because he was not of this world. Then as certainly as these are engaged in it, they demonstrate that they are not of Christ, nor of the truth of Christ, but are of this world. And they being of this world, yet professing the name of Christianity, seek, um, seek to run Christianity in the mold and the form of this world. And that is Antichrist. Let us read a text in which we have a definite state statement upon this subject. In the book of Luke, 12th chapter, 13th verse to the 21st. One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Here's a man whose parents had died, leaving an inheritance. His brother, it seems, had not dealt fairly with him, and he calls upon Jesus to speak to the brother and have him act right in the matter. That was, in principle, asking Jesus to take the position of a magistrate or an arbiter, arbitrator, ar, arbitrator. Ar, arbiter, that word doesn't look like it's spelled right, but arbiter, arbitrator, anyway in affairs of this world, concerning things that pertain to the government of this world, to sit in judgment upon that case and decide what was right and direct accordingly. It is a case that contains the whole principle which is involved in the evidences which we read in the extracts given in the two preceding lessons. And he said unto him, man, who made you me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto him, not simply to him, but that was the text from which Christ would teach him and all the rest a lesson. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be but uh, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, for the application of another point upon ambassadorship, ambassadors are rightly sent from one government, one kingdom, to another. He is not sent there, as we found in studying the former point, to manipulate, to interfere, or have anything to do with the affairs of the government or of the people of that government. And as they stand related to that government, he is sent to that country, to that government, to attend to the affairs of his own government, as they may arise in that government or in that country. That is what he is here for. There are subjects of Great Britain in the United States, and there are in this country interests that concern Great Britain in connection with her subjects here. She sends her ambassadors here, a personal national representative, to attend to the affairs of Great Britain and of the subjects of Great Britain. As these things may arise within the territory 
of this government and to these things alone is he to turn his attention and devote his time to the affairs of his own country as they may arise in the country where he is. So was Jesus Christ sent as the ambassador of God to this world. He was in the country of Judea, the government, the dominion, and the jurisdiction of Rome. And he was asked to attend to the affairs and take jurisdiction in matters that pertain to that other country. But instead of yielding to the invitation, he stuck closely to the affairs that belonged to his own country. They asked him to act as a judge and a divider in the things that belonged to get altogether to the government in whose territory he was and where the man was. But he was not there to attend to these things. He was there to attend to the affairs of the kingdom of God, the affairs of the government which sent him. And instead of crossing the line and interfering um, with the affairs that belonged properly under the jurisdiction of this world, he, as became him, was loyal to the kingdom to which he belonged and to the king whom he represented. And accordingly, he adhered strictly and attended closely to the affairs of that government of the kingdom of God as they arose in that kingdom of this world. God has a people in this world. He has interests in this world. His people have interests in this world. That is true. Therefore, God rightly has ambassadors in this world. But they are here to attend to the affairs of the kingdom of God and the people of God as the affairs of the kingdom of God may arise in the course of things in this world and not at all to any affairs of the kingdoms of this world. And the ambassador for Jesus Christ that goes over the line and undertakes to attend to the affairs of this world abandons his own government, breaks his allegiance to his own king and unlawfully and illegally invades the province of another government. That is why the wickedness of this thing is so great. That is why it made the beast in the first place. That is why the violation of these principles makes the image of the beast in the second place. Now I want to ask you a question. Taking only the texts which we have studied tonight and the principles that lie in them, not that are brought to them, but lie in inevitably in them, Taking those texts alone, and if these principles of the church had been strictly adhered to, as they were by Jesus Christ in this world, would there or could there ever have been a papacy? Could there have been such a thing as the beast? Could there ever, then, have been such a thing as the image of the beast? No, sir. That is evidently true. Then upon that, as the violation of those principles inevitably uh, uh, made the beast in the first place, the violation of those principles in the second place could not possibly do anything else than make the image of the beast. It was not because the people, the professed Christians in the Roman Empire, were worse than any other professed Christians that ever were that made the papacy. It was not that. It was the violation of the best principles that ever came into the world that made the worst thing that ever was in the world. And when God had called the world once more unto himself by the principles of Christianity through the work of the Reformation and set forth once more the principles of Christianity as against the beast, that made Protestantism as it was. And when these professed Protestants violate these principles, it brings the same identical thing in the perfect image of the original thing that was made by the violation of the principles in the first place. Then it has been demonstrated before all the world on these two occasions that the violation of those principles revealed in the verses which we have read can do nothing else than curse the world with the very papal beastly spirit. Then what thing is most to be avoided by everyone that names the name of Christ? It is the violation of those principles. And if it comes home, even to Seventh-day Adventists themselves, the thing to be done is to wed ourselves eternally to the principles and hold to them because those principles violated by the Seventh-day Adventists will work the workings of the papacy as well as by Protestants or Catholics. So I say again, it was not because the professed Christians of the Roman Empire were worse than any other people on the earth that made the papacy as bad as it was. 
It was not because the Protestant church leaders in this land are worse than anybody else that the image of the beast has been made and is carrying on its cruel workings. But it is because those people violated the principles that have been laid down for the good of the world. And the violation of them can do nothing else than to curse the world. And if they are violated by Seventh-day Adventists even, it will be a curse, a curse wherever it is done. And now we can see, of course, the Adventist church is in that place now. But we're also in that place now. Right? We are political. Not necessarily political in the politics of this world in, in the broadest sense. Ever since, ever well, since the, vac the, the vaccination. You know, well, <clears throat> getting the jab and all that. Yeah, being upset about it and, and fighting against it because because we're not using the gospel to fight against it, right? Right. People are we're signing petitions, and they're even signing petitions against the church. And 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 why why would that be wrong? Are we to be involved in the politics of the church? Yeah, using the using the uh, worldly manner to do it. Right. We're, we're just doing the same thing as the world. We're using pressure to control people, right? I mean, the church has no control over me. At least it shouldn't have control over me, right? I mean, the organization. If I am to be united with Christ, I'm united with those that are united with Christ. And I will be working and cooperating with Christ. You know, so there is a role for organization, but not the way in which it's it's being operated now. And to just get into that fight, uh, that would be a mistake. But even on a more personal level within this movement, I mean, one of the things that we must believe is that truth will stand investigation. Right? If something is true, um, anything that, that we study, that we come to understand, uh, one of the things we should always seek is to have it investigated by others, right? I mean, one of the reasons we write papers and we do presentations and we do studies is we want to test what we are studying, right? Because we want to come to what is true. Now, right. if I and if I think something's true, but I don't let it be investigated, then I don't really trust it to be true. And and I may think that I can, you know, force the issue. I can manipulate people to take a stand on something that I believe to be true. But if they've done it against them, their will so to speak. I mean, obviously they assented to it, but if they are manipulated, deceived in some way, uh, there would be no benefit. You know, that's why everything should be as open as the day. Everything that we do, it should be open to the light of God's word, to, to examination. And so in when we have divisions and we have a party spirit, we have politics, and that's just modeling after the world. <clears throat> so Jones goes on. He says, once more, and then we will have, we'll have to close this les lesson at about halfway through. John 17, verse 9. I pray for them, that is, his disciples, whom he said to the Father, Thou hast given me out of the given me out of this world out of the world. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Then can the man whose affections and attention and his working and labor are upon the world and engaged in the affairs of this world have the benefit of that prayer? No, sir. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Given me out of the world, taken from the world, given them to me, I pray for them. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then every man who would have the benefit of that prayer 
must be separated from the world, from the things of this world, from the affairs of this world, his affections off from anything that is in the world or of it, as certainly and as entirely as Jesus Christ himself, for they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So <clears throat> he laid down some fairly simple ideas and didn't take very long to get through uh, that. It was about 12 pages. And that's half his study. A any thoughts? We had some thoughts there about, you know, the politics that have happened with the, the mandates and how we felt about it. I mean, nobody likes having their rights violated. Nobody likes to be in a situation where they're uh, uh, being put under pressure to do something that goes against their beliefs. But Jesus says, if my kingdom is not, is not of this world, but if my kingdom were of this world, then would my, my uh, um, servants fight, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. so, so one of the things we can see, I mean, we can see the condition of the world. We can see that we don't want to be like the world and that we can't get involved in politics. That we're not going to solve the world's problems with politics. And we can see that in the church, um, that the politics of the church itself, I mean, the church is just part of the world, right? It's, it's made that stance. It wants to be friends of the world in the pretense that it can somehow convert them. And so we can see that and we can cr criticize that. But the question that we have to ask ourselves in this context of the third angel's message is what is it going to take for us to stand on the principles of Christ's kingdom as against the world? Are we going to be able to trust God's word in spite of what we see happening around us, in spite of our own desires and wants? Hey, we don't want to get caught up in a fray, you know. Yeah. Well, definitely we don't want to be um, – we don't want to get caught up in the things of the world. Now, we, we all admit, at least I hope we admit, that, that we sympathize with um, – the, well, we, we know that the American government was set up, set, set up on the principles uh, that are, are biblical principles, right? All men are created equal, right? Yep. The Constitution. These principles uh, are principles that are Christian principles. <clears throat> um, without the gospel these principles couldn't be set up. So how do we make the distinction, though, between the Constitution and politics? I mean, shouldn't we fight for the principles of the Constitution? How do we make that distinction? Because that's the way that people would look at it. Well, you know, we, we don't... Um, <clears throat> We don't want to comply with what the government wants because it goes against our rights. So how do we how do we address that problem? Because it does typify what's going to happen at the time of the Sunday law. So what's the distinction here? We have a constitution that's built upon godly principles.
And that's a government built upon godly principles. And so a person could argue, well, you know, you, the United States is God's kingdom, right? A.T. Jones would call this the false theocratic theory, the idea that God is in charge of the state because the United States is founded uh, by God, right? This would be the, like, a, like a theocracy then. <clears throat> yeah. The theocracy. Right. right. So so that's the way, and, and Jones addresses this in other places, and, and I'm pretty sure it's in this series that he's going to address that, but I know he addresses it other places. Um so the argument that they would make against what Jones is saying is, well, this is a Christian nation. This is God's nation. And that God's nation needs to follow God's laws, right? So that, they mean, that, that means they would believe that the United States is a theocracy based upon God's principles of government, right? So that would be their argument. So that the laws of the land should align with the laws of God's government. So how do we argue against that? Well, Jones has said that Christ said his kingdom is not of this world. Now, did God at one time have a theocracy? Yes. Yeah. Under under the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt. How did that turn out? People rejected it. Yeah, so what ended up happening is that God's people rejected him as their king, right? Certainly. Right. So, so has the United States rejected God as their king? Just because they... They set up a constitution based upon God's principles. They have horns like a lamb, right? But they spake as a dragon. And we can see that those two horns, republicanism and Protestantism, do in some ways represent these Protestant principles of the separation of church and state. Republicanism. What is republicanism? How is that different from a theocracy? Well, for you Americans, what, what does it mean to mean that the United States is a republic? Well, the Republic upholds the Constitution despite what the majority wants. Okay, so so it's not a democracy in <laughs> like a tyranny of the democracy. <clears throat> right. Right. <clears throat> so it's based upon Republican principles. That is, you have a Constitution. And this Constitution was based upon on Christian principles, Right. Yeah, all men are created equal and certain animal rights. Yeah, yeah, okay. But how is it, What what is the basic underlying idea of a republic? Why, why was the idea of a republic thought to be unlikely to succeed by the founding fathers? Why did they think it was unlikely to succeed? And they were correct. Why does it not succeed? Well, we're in the fourth generation. <laughs> okay. <I guess. laughs> but, but the idea is that in order for a republic to survive, the individuals within that country have to accept 
the principles under which that government is set up. It's very individualistic. Right? The whole idea of the United States, as I understand it, is that it, it sets the individual as responsible for his own decisions. Does that make yeah, sense? I would, yeah, I would see that. See yeah. that as... Right. So the state is not to support the individual as such. Like it's not a nanny state. The idea of the republic, as I understand it, is that individuals themselves have to take up the responsibilities that come with the rights that are given to them. And they're not really given to them by the state. I mean, they could be protected, I guess, by the state. But these are rights that are given to us by God. That we have the, the right to make our own choices about what we believe and how we act. And if we act in an unchristian way, there is nothing that the state can do to change that unless it becomes a tyranny. Right. So I look at the Republic of the United States as setting up the individual responsibility of each individual. And within that, we then can decide what kingdom we are of, whether we're of the world or whether we're of Christ. Because there is nothing in the United States Constitution, in fact, it's quite the opposite, because it says that there is a freedom of religion, right? That we have the ability to choose who we are going to serve. You have that in Canada too, right? That well, basic principle? Yeah, it, it's somewhat. But it, the problem in Canada is in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, group rights uh, trump individual rights. So individual rights don't really mean anything. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah. But in the United States, individual rights are really, if you protect individual rights, you protect all rights. Right. Once you start having groups, uh, they're always going to trump the rights of the individual. So, so you can't have such a thing as group rights, but those were enshrined in, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, Justin Trudeau's dad. It's one of the biggest mistakes he ever made, but um, the other one was having Justin Trudeau as a son. But that's a whole other story. The point is that we could take up a fight against injustice as it exists in the world. But there is a way that we can fight injustice. And how would we do that as a Christian? Well, with the gospel. Um... Yeah. Well, what we could just be just, couldn't we? <clears throat> yeah. So if we're just, if every person was just, we would have no injustice. But you can't create justice with unjust people, right? If people are unjust, you can make no laws that can make people just. And you can't bring about justice. Okay. Because people are acting unjust all the time. And it doesn't matter how many laws you make against it. People will still be acting unjust. They'll be treating each other poorly. They'll be fighting for their own rights instead of understanding that justice is fighting for the rights of others, not through political means, but, but by personal labor. And the gospel is the most powerful way to free people from the tyranny of injustice. 
Because if you are free in Christ, you are free indeed, no matter what man does to you. But if you try to find justice in this world, you will not find it. So there's no point complaining about injustice that's done to you personally. Just be just with others. Now, we often experience injustice, and we, we feel pretty bad about it, right? We don't want to be treated poorly, but we are. And we need to accept that, that that happened to Christ. It will happen to us, that the world will hate us. Now, if we're in Christ and we're following Christ and somebody hates us, what does that say about the other person who hates us? Can we hate our brothers? No, and, we can't hate them back. Well, well, the thing because is... They, because they hate me, you know? Yeah, if we hate our brothers... Do we love God? Uh, no. When we're treated unjustly, if we feel bitterness and hatred and anger and seek to have justice, if we're misrepresented, if we're gossiped about, and we seek to do harm to those that we feel hurt by, we're showing that we're of this world. So these are the principles that Jones is laying down. And these are the principles of righteousness by faith. And we often neglect these things because we think about righteousness by faith as just stopping from doing bad things, sinning, right? However, we sort of characterize that. We might think we have some bad habits or um, we have things you know, that tempt us and we over get overcome by temptation. And we think that's what righteousness by faith is about. But righteousness by faith is, in some ways, it's justice by faith. It's being just. It's being righteous. There is really not a distinction. I mean, it's right doing. It's doing right to those around us. No matter how they treat us. So we're get, we look at this, of course, when we study this uh, number four um, next Friday. But we need to think about the principles that are here in this study as we go about this week, as we deal with the injustices that we experience and that we see around us and understand that the remedy to these injustices are being faithful to the principles of Christ's kingdom. <clears throat> Any final comments before we close with prayer? Uh, not for me. No. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, uh, thank you for um, the study this evening. I pray for each person who watches this study. Uh, that they can examine their own hearts and recognize the need that they have of Christ. We ask, Lord, that we can be faithful ambassadors, citizens of your kingdom, and that we can minister uh, to those around us, that we can uh, promote your kingdom, your way of doing things to all, that they may become citizens of your kingdom. Thank you for the Sabbath. We pray that the meetings will be a blessing to each person. We pray for the studies tomorrow and ask that you can use us to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>